to be here with you this morning. Let's stand together again. I was buried beneath my shame And who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you And I was breathing the night Alive And all my failures I try To hide It was my turn Till I met you So my name is Barry Bright. Um, my wife and I, Eileen, have been a part of Hope Point for about 11 years. Uh, we have three kids who are growing up in, uh, in the Hope Point Kids program, and so we've, we've been tremendously blessed by that. But uh, Hope Point's been really special to us because Christ has met us there for about 11 years. Um, John Piper says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. And so Hope Point has been an integral part of us finding our satisfaction in Jesus Christ. 
And so we see that in Richard's preaching. We see it in the gospel seed planted in the lives of our children. Uh, we see it in the community that we have with our, our Hope Point community group. And it's just been a tremendous blessing to us. And, and the Lord's really revealed himself to us in so many different ways through, uh, through Hope Point and the ministry there. I'm excited for the next phase at uh, Hope Point and excited for more of the same, really. When I say more of the same, what I mean is that I think that Hope Point has a certain DNA that we recognized early on that was the gospel presentation, a, um, a, such a desire for people to be fed by the gospel and to be spiritually engaged. And that's not going to change with, uh, with a new property or new building. Uh, it's just going to enhance and increase those opportunities to minister to more and more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, to impact more lives. So that's what I'm really excited for. I'm also excited to see how God redirects the energy that has gone into turning uh, a mobile uh, campus into a sanctuary on Sunday morning. So many hours are spent with people trying to uh, prepare for, uh, for church and then after church they break it down. And so uh, thinking about how God might use that, uh, that energy and focus it on discipleship uh, really excites me. I've seen Christ at work in my own life uh, through Hope Point and the many people have poured into my life. First Corinthians 3, 6 says, uh, this is the Apostle Paul says, I planted this, uh, the seed, uh, Apollos watered it, but God gave the growth. And so it's just been fascinating over the years to think about all the people who have poured into my life, those people who have planted seed, other people who have watered that seed and for God to make something beautiful out of it. So I'm grateful to God for that and I'm grateful to God for Hope Point. Over the past 15 months, we have <clears throat> heard from so many of you uh, the excitement of moving from being a mobile uh, church to uh, having a permanent facility and permanent property, and ever so often people would voice that with such enthusiasm. We would ask them, would you let us record you on video, or would you type that out? And so Barry Bright is certainly one of those people that we wanted uh, to hear from you. We're so grateful for the Bright families, and they, they simply are representative of many of you. If, if you don't know what we're talking about, and when we talk about Hope Planted and the new facility, if for some reason you don't have email, or you don't have a post office box, or you've been unconscious for the past 15 months, I'm sorry that we didn't go around to visiting you in your state. But it has been a buzz around here, and we are in the process of uh, transitioning from this mobile church to a property on Asheville Highway. We're purchasing the building for $1.5 million and putting $2.5 million into the renovation. And we've tried to keep you informed all along the way, but I realize that some of you uh, may have missed a Sunday or two. So let me just uh, sort of get you up to speed that if you want to know what is Hope Planted, uh, the capital campaign to make this possible. How can you find out anything about that and the property? Just go to the website, our normal hopepoint.org website, and click here on the purple bar, and it will take you to a dedicated website um, that will answer many questions. All the videos, all the information that we've communicated over the past four weeks are included um, in those videos, including if you would like to see some schematics from the architect of... Uh, how he's going to transition a 37,000-square-foot warehouse into a space for uh, worship and the training of, of students and uh, the caring of children and the holding of babies and the outreach to a city and uh, the farther outreach to the nations. All of it will be found there. And then there is a, a commitment for, a form after you continue to view the website and finish your praying over these final two weeks. Please go to the commitment form, fill out your name, address, email, and then the gift um, that you would like to give in co-laboring with all of the families of Hope Point uh, to make this $1.5 million goal. We're, we would like $1.5 million pledged over the next three years, and then that will allow us to not interrupt any of our basic operating expenses and, and missions giving. If we can just get $1.5 million up front, over three years, and then on May 20th, if you would bring 10%, 10% of your three-year gift, if you're going to give, if 
you're going to give a million in, in your, you shouldn't laugh, if you're going to give <laughs> a million over three years, then bring 100,000 on, um, on May 20th. I'm going to laugh at you when that happens. <laughs> Let me pray. Father, we're, we're grateful, we laugh, um, because it would be supernatural. You would have stirred someone's heart, and then you would have equipped them with an unusual ability to earn large amounts of money. So, Lord, on that end of the spectrum, we're grateful for people that you have blessed, like your servant Job, who's just blessed from the earth. And then, Lord, we're blessed to know the rest of us who week by week and month by month sort out finances, and we're grateful, Lord, for clothes to wear and food to eat, and we're so grateful that there's a little bit of money in savings, and you're so generous, God. But now I dedicate this people to you once again. I lay these people before you. I take them to the throne of God. Right now, Father, would you gather these people up in your arms and for the next two weeks speak to them about gifts, large and gifts, small. But gifts all coming with sacrifice for the cause of Christ, for the planting and proclaiming of hope. And Father, I know that in this room today, there are some people who are so barraged by depression, anxiety, uh, medical challenges, parental challenges, marital challenges, they can't even think about giving. So I pray for this moment, Lord, you would set them free from anxiety and bathe them in the love of Christ. May the power of the Holy Spirit do far more than my tiny little black letters on white page. I am nothing. I have nothing to say today, O oh God, except what you say. I beg you for a double portion of the Spirit to fall upon me, that I would not be a clanging bell, a gong, but I would be the voice of God, the voice of love and the voice of hope and the voice of conviction. So, Lord, because of this service today, we pray that tens of thousands of believers will be, will be protected in Iran where they're being tortured. The gospel will spread rapidly in that country. Lord, and we pray for these students facing more temptation than any generation ever. And Lord, we pray today that they would decide once and for all to become a true follower of Christ. And Lord, for the rest of us, we cry out with Isaiah, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Do what you want. This is a blank piece of paper we give you. Fill it in, God, and give us the power of the Holy Spirit to obey with joy. In Christ's name I pray, amen. During my, uh, my second year at, um, at seminary, uh, I drove a school bus, uh, and it primarily... Uh, ministered to a group of inner-city kids that lived uh, in a downtown housing complex uh, called Ripley Arnold, a very dangerous place in inner-city Fort Worth. The school bus afforded me many relationships with parents, so every Tuesday night, Lisa and I would go down there, and we would lead a, a Bible study, and we, our point person down there was a wonderful woman named Louise Medina. One day before class, Louise called me, and she said, Richard, do you have time to go to the Tarrant County Courthouse and, and jail today? My son did a bad thing last night. I need you to visit him. He'd take a 22 caliber pistol and gotten drunk and got in an altercation and shot two people and they died. And age 18, his whole life changed. I went to visit him and then I went to visit his mom, Louise. Uh, and I was struck by the comment that came out of her mouth. She said, I wish my son were not in jail, but it is not my fault that he is. She wasn't trying to claim to be a perfect parent, but she said, I gave him the best life I could give him without a father here in the inner city. I worked as hard as I could as a single mother. It's not my fault how he has ended up. 
This is the same line of thought that God uses in Isaiah chapter 5. The metaphor changes. It's no longer a parent saying, I did all I could for a child. But now it's a gardener saying, I did the best I could for my vineyard. And then God asks in Isaiah chapter 5 verse 4, what more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? There are at least three places in the Old Testament where God compares the people of Israel to a, a vine. Here in Isaiah 5, Jeremiah 2, and Psalm 80. Psalm 80 is my favorite Old Testament reference. Psalm 80, you transplanted a vine from Egypt. This is, of course, talking about the nation of Israel. It took root and filled the land, and the mountains were covered with its shade, and its branches reached as far as the sea. So that's Old Testament references to God's people being compared to vine. Then there's a New Testament reference. In fact, the last parable that Jesus Christ ever told was that of this uh, agriculture, uh, this vineyard concept. Matthew 21, there was a landowner who planted a vineyard. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. So the one common theme in all of the vine passages, Old Testament and New Testament, is there comes a time where the owner of the vineyard is expecting to see fruit. And in each case, in Old Testament and New Testament, these metaphors, the, old, the, the owner does not see fruit, but instead he sees rotten, rotten vines. I have some friends who live in, um, in Nicaragua. In fact, they met at my wedding, at least not our wedding in um, 1983. They didn't know each other, and they met at our wedding and fell in love. And, and they've been serving the Lord for a long time in Nicar Nicaragua, and they have uh, a fruit farm. Uh, they, they raise pineapples. It's called Pineapples for Peace. And they try to do three things with the pineapples. They provide employment for the local people. And they've uh, built a pastor's college with the proceeds, and then they have just the ability to give to the poor who are unable to work. And I want to ask you a question today. Do you think my friends down in Nicaragua, do they care whether or not they have fruit at the end of the season? Do they care? Yes, they care. That's the only thing they care about. I go through all of this labor of pouring time and attention into the soil. The only thing they want to see is fruit. And this is the predicament in Isaiah chapter 5. It's the most exacting of all the fruit parables where God does not see fruit. And the question is raised at this point, is it God's fault that there was no fruit from the vineyard? Let's start. Looking at Isaiah chapter 5, I will sing a song, or I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. So Isaiah the prophet, sometimes in order to, to, to keep the attention of a church, you have to do something a little shocking. And in this case, he says, I'm going to sing out of love for God. I'm going to sing a parable. You noticed last week how we concluded, in order to get your attention to fall in love with God's dream, we had a hunter sing the first song that's ever going to be performed in the new facility. He went out to Asheville Highway, and our camera guys went, and so he sang that song, All Glory Be to Christ. This is what Isaiah is doing. I'm, I'm trying to shock you into loving God, so I'm going to sing instead of preach is what we did Last week, and you can, that song is gorgeous. Again, you can go to the website, follow the arrows that you saw earlier today, and you can hear that magnificent song. So Isaiah is in a singing mood. Isaiah 5, verse 2. He, he dug it up, the farmer dug it up, cleared it of all the stones, and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press. As well, so if you were a farmer and you were into vineyards, you had to do four things in order for uh, to have a successful crop. Number one, you have to select a site, and here it was. It was he dug it up, and it's a site that he would have picked 
fertile soil, pregnant with potential. So he picks a site that is full of possibility. And then he prepares the land. And in Israel, when you're going to grow something, you normally prepare the land by spending days and days picking up stones, rocks. There was an old uh, rabbi tale that uh, when God uh, was creating the earth, he filled uh, a bag with stones and put it on the back of Gabriel and said, cast stones over all the earth. It said when he was flying over Israel, the bag burst. And all the rocks of the world fell in Israel. If you've ever visited, that's what you see. So you've got to clear out rocks. And then the best vine was planted here, third line down, a choice vine. If you were going to grow a, a juicy, red, exceptionally tasty grapes in Israel, you would probably go to the Sorek Valley, southwest of Jerusalem, and find a vine there and transplant it to wherever you lived in, in Palestine. And then after all of that was done, you build a watchtower because the animals are going to come at night and they're going to try to eat it up, the goats. And then thieves, if you have a good vineyard, thieves are going to come and they're going to try to steal your grapes. So you, you build a watchtower and station somebody on there every night to protect your, your investment. And then finally... Uh, this owner built a wine press. And you say, well, you don't need to build a wine press in order for grapes to grow. Why would he do that? W what's he thinking? If I find soil that's pregnant with possibility and I clear it of all stones and I get the choicest vine from the Sork Valley and I build a watchtower to keep predators away, I'm guaranteed growth. So he already knows that he's going to have a beautiful crop. Um, as you know, the, the, um, our capital campaign program uh, is called Hope Planted. And uh, it's pretty silly when you think about how many words we, how many phrases we, 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 we thought about. You know, I, I submitted a phrase, deep pockets, and that was rejected. But anyway, um, hope planted is one that, that won out. And um, what we love so much about this is because it, it, it takes us all the way back to 2003 when God planted a church here. He just planted it. With, just planted it. Nothing, it didn't exist in 2002. He planted a church. It's beautiful, isn't it? He planted, now he's replanting. That's, that's why we went the name. He's replanting a church in, in the center of town on, on Asheville Highway. Don't you, don't you love the concept of something being planted? I went, went to visit Mama a couple weekends ago, and we went down to the flower shop in the middle of North Augusta, and we bought her some petunias for, for this spring, and uh, it just totally changed her front porch. As people drive by, my mama offers beauty to everybody in the neighborhood because a plant uh, exists on her front porch. You know what verse we chose to go with Hope Planted? One of my favorites in, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 61.3. This is on the front of the beautiful brochure that Dean, Dean did for us. They will be called Oaks of Righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor or glory. We wanted to show beauty and hope and peace and love and transforming power to families all over the county and by God's grace all over the world. And that's why we chose Isaiah 61, 3. And Later today, you need to read that because that is part of the fabric of the very first words that Jesus Christ ever preached in Luke chapter 4 in his hometown when he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. That's in the first part of Isaiah 61, and that's how it ends. It's glorious reminder of hope when God plants us where he wants us to. So why does God plant and replant his people? So that we can declare and 
display, declare and display the hope of God that's found in Jesus Christ. That's the fruit that we bear. Jesus was very serious about this in John 15. He said, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. And by the way, this was read last Sunday night by one of the people who led us in prayer for, um, uh, for our time of question and answer. And it just in, sort of inspired me to make sure it found its way in today's message. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. You are the branches, hope point. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Declare and display the hope of Jesus Christ is the reason that God has chosen you. Declare and display. And look, look at the specific way in which Jesus ends this. This is what will bring my Father glory. This is what will shine the spotlight on Him. This is what will bring people to him. This is what will cause people to taste and see that the Lord is good. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Much. Much. Showing yourself to be my disciples. Your whole purpose in life is to point people to God because he's the only one who can satisfy the great longings of their heart. That's what it means to glorify God, put the spotlight on him, do something, say something so that people see God and you bear fruit by having someone interact with God because of your deeds or your words. Thirteen of you just announced your... Uh, graduating from high school and handi- uh, heading off to the next season of your life? Do you know what your purpose is in, in, in college? Your purpose is to go bear fruit and glorify God. This is to my Father's glory that you go to Furman, you go to Clemson, you go to Spartanburg Methodist College, and you point people, people look at your life. They look at your life, and when they look at your life, and when they listen to your words, they are attracted to the glory of God, and they taste and see that the Lord is good. That's your purpose for life. Our staff went over this week to the new property to pray, and um, we pulled in the parking lot, and there was a woman in her car near the, really more near Asheville Highway, and we were more near the entrance to the building. And it was like we, we took three or four cars over there. Uh, and so yet four cars, like a secret service, and the president was coming in. And so we didn't want to scare her, but she was a beautiful soul, had basically transformed that little part of the parking lot into a flea market. And was selling all sorts of things, maybe 30 or 40 items for sale. And so we all went by, Ronnie started, and then we all went by and introduced ourselves to her and told her we were here just to pray for the building we're purchasing. And she said, this community needs light. We're glad you're here, and I'm praying that your activities will bring God glory. And I said, well, we'll be back in a year to move in. I hope you're here. Did you see the Kentucky Derby yesterday? It was amazing that it could even be um, run. There at Churchill Downs in Louisville, three inches of rain in one day. And somehow those horses still know how to do that. And and in order to, to make it around that, you know, it's just the, the largest or the fastest two minutes in sports, to make it around the oval, some of the jockeys would have to wear seven pair of glasses because of all the mud that's coming up from the horses in, in front of them. And uh, this horse, I would love to meet the owner. I may send him an email today. I said, let's meet. <laughs> he named his horse Justified. 
I don't know why you do that. I mean, like the most important word in the New Testament means you're not guilty because Christ took your guilt. You're not guilty because Christ took your guilt. You're justified. And I think it may mean that, and I'll tell you why. So Mike Smith is uh, riding him, second oldest um, jockey in the, um, in the Derby, and uh, already had won the Kentucky Derby once and won it again yesterday on Justified. And so as soon as he won, this TV announcer came, wanted to interview him, and so she said to him, Mike Smith, congratulations. You get your second Derby win, and in doing so, you break a 136-year-old streak that says that a horse that did not race as a two-year-old, Justified didn't, a horse that didn't race as a two-year-old can win the Derby. How special is Justified? Mike replied, first of all, I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for blessing us on this afternoon and blessing us with this amazing horse. So this man understands, I got 15 seconds on, the, on a world stage. I got two billion people listening to my words. I refuse to glorify myself. I'm going to bring attention to Jesus who makes horses. John 15, 8, this is to my Father's glory. This is what will bring him glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Now, hear me clear on this. I believe this with all my heart. I don't care if you are, have been confirmed, baptized, rebaptized. You are in small group and you say the right things to group members. I don't care if you pray the rosary several times a day or you said the sinner's prayer at youth camp, if the passion of your life is not that God would be loved and honored, you are not a believer. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Got teenagers leaving this stage, going to college. Majority of them, no doubt, they're going to fall away. <clears throat> Maybe not at this church. Probably, though. Maybe not at this church. But statistically, all the kids from the churches that are having their send-off today are going to fall away. <clears throat> and then everybody wants to know, how did the church fail them? And it did not at all. They fell away from God because they did not love His glory. And they loved the glory of sin, the glory of immorality, the glory of alcohol and drunkenness. They loved the glory of those items more than the glory of God. And that is it, the only reason people fall away when they go to college. How horrible it would be to think this is what will bring God glory, bearing much fruit, and I spend my life glorifying, in college, glorifying evil. And by my life and my words, my life for the next four years is used to attract people to evil. Now that is the saddest story could happen from a person's life. And may God so work right now and produce fear and trembling in the lives of these 13 that in this case or an entire new generation of graduates that all of those statistics are no more. But that's the danger to spend the next four years of your life glorifying evil. Isaiah 5 verse 4, 
What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? You know what God is saying here? I have done everything that is possible. It's not the church's fault you fall away. It's not God's fault you fall away. What more could God have done? Nothing. I spoke at a, um, a little Baptist church, a, a little four-day revival many years ago. And when I left, there was a man there named uh, Ronnie. And his, uh, his job in life, he blew scientific glass. That is unbelievable. I mean, you could just get the glass heated up and, and uh, make test tubes out of it. And, and, uh, and so he gave me this, this glass bottle. And he said, I'm giving you a glass bottle, a vase. I made it for you at work. And your job every day is to keep it filled with flowers for Lisa. He said, I can make a glass vase. I can't put flowers in it for you. That's Isaiah 5. I can... I could preach the gospel. I can, we could plant a, a gorgeous church where our spirits are refreshed every week. But this, this thing called desire, your will, you, you, you have to see all of this. You've got to see Jesus on the cross, Jesus risen from the tomb, Jesus carrying your sins, Jesus justifying you so you're not guilty as he absorbs your guilt. You've got to see all of that, and you have to respond by saying, I want to bear fruit for you, Jesus. I can't do that for you. 2 Peter 1.3, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. No one, I should have had this as PowerPoint, don't have it. No one possesses an acceptable excuse for not living a godly, obedient, loving, giving, fruitful life. No one possesses an acceptable excuse for not living a godly, obedient, loving, giving, fruitful life. Your life may be rocky, but God has cleared out enough stones so you can grow. You may not be the most gifted person in the world, but you have at least one gift by which you can point others to God. And you may be surrounded by all sorts of enemies, physical, medical, psychological, spiritual, but in the middle of your heart sits a guard, and his name is Jesus Christ. You can grow if you want to grow. I want to share a long story with you, but as I have humbly told you before, I am a great storyteller, so this shall not be boring. I just love stories. If anybody should have said, I have an excuse, I have an excuse to fail, it would be Robert Howard Allen. His parents were divorced a few months before he was born, even at age 42, when this article was written. He had never seen his father. His mother, Hazel, was a bitter woman that made him feel like an unloved mistake. His uncle, Eddie, really raised him, um, kept him isolated from the world most of his life, thought that school was a waste of time, and um, therefore did not allow him to attend school. The first time he would ever step into a classroom was when he was 32 years old. Fortunately, his Aunt Bevy taught him to read. And fortunately, his Aunt Ida was blind and needed somebody to read to her. Twice before she died, Robert read the entire Bible to her. His fascination with reading only grew. By the time he was 12, he was into the works of Shakespeare. And by, he, by the time he was 20... Going to yard sales, he had acquired over 2,000 books in his library. The first time he ever saw the Carroll County Library, he thought he had landed in a gold mine. Over the next few years, he would work his way through the entire library, teaching himself Greek and French. At age 30, Robert earned a diploma by taking a high school equivalency test. And two years later, he entered Bethel college in McKenzie, Tennessee. And it was clear from the start the boy was a fish out of water. His hair was messy. His front teeth were gone. His sweater was held together uh, with pins. 
Um, he had never had access, never had access to indoor plumbing, never ridden a bicycle, never seen the inside of a movie theater, never been on a date, and he was 32 years old. But he never used any of that as an excuse for failing. Three years later, he graduated with straight A's, except for um, a B in typing. By their own admission, his professor said he has a broader range of knowledge than we do. Shortly after graduation, he moved to Nashville, where he began working on his master's degree at Vanderbilt. And while he was there, he experienced one of his many firsts in life, riding on an elevator. In 1986, he received his master's degree from, from Vanderbilt and, in English. And in the early part of 1991, he received his Ph.D. from this one of America's most prestigious universities. And so as of the fall of 1991, Robert Allen Howard, the boy who started with no parents, no friends, no money, no school, began working as a professor of English at Bethel College in McKenzie, Tennessee. And so I submit to you today if Robert Howard Allen can overcome those odds and achieved by the sheer power of the human will. Can we not do much greater things with our lives who are inhabited by the great divine power of the Holy Spirit? If he can be motivated by a career, can we not be motivated by the cross? When I look at life of Robert Allen... I just say, what's the difference between him and so many other people in life? And I think it's just one word, desire. Desire. He didn't let circumstances, people, hardship, or even the degree of temptation. You can allow all those things, circumstances, people, hardship, and the degree of temptation. You can use all of those as an excuse. I'm going to say that again. Circumstances, people, hardship, the degree of temptation to which Satan takes you. You can use that as an excuse or you can desire God and overcome every one of those attacks. You know what's going to happen? Do you know, listen, the reason I would be uh, challenging it all today, do you know what's going to happen when you stand before God? You're going to stand before God and you're going to lay out all of the excuses of why you are like you are, what you, why you did what you did, and his big, mighty right arm is going to wipe them all off the table. Because he said in Romans chapter 1, no one has an excuse God will say, I gave you enough, and you just chose not to respond. You chose not to read the Bible. You chose not to pray. Chose not, you chose to keep that one sin secret. You chose to remain bitter. You chose to remain defeated. You chose to live in the past. You chose not to allow God to heal you. You chose not to allow God to forgive you. You chose not to allow God to use you. As you know, William Booth, the founder of the, of the Salvation Army, um, in his lifetime he traveled 5 million miles and preached 60,000 sermons. The motto for the Salvation Army was, the world for God. That's a good vision statement. <laughs> he began in the late 1880s, taking his army out all over the world. In the late 1880s, he, connected, he, he collected 393,000 signatures that affected the lives of many young teenage girls that were being forced into prostitution. It was called white slavery there in London. And they abolished it because of the Salvation Army. He continued to pour his life into young people. Eventually, the missionaries of the Salvation Army were in 91 countries, 25,000 people. Strong, sort of sounds like Campus Crusade for Christ. Now, 
But if you would have looked at the early life of William Booth, you'd have said this is not how it's going to end. Born into poverty, little education. His father died when he was 14 years old, and he was forced to become a pawnbroker's apprentice. How do you do it? Desire. I want to love God. And I want my life to bear fruit, to point people to God. This is how William Booth says it. So far as I know, God has had all of me there is. There have been men with greater brains, greater opportunities than I. But from the day I had a vision of what God could do with poor old London, I made up my mind that God would have all there is of William Booth. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this would be a history-shaping day for this church where we would search long and hard and deep and wide to see if there's any areas that have not yet been given to you, areas that are glorifying evil instead of glorifying our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm asking you, O oh God, I cannot imagine what would happen, the power that would be released from these people if we could say, God has all of me that there is. Father, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, as we look at the cross on which Jesus died, as we look at the tomb from which he was raised, as we look at the Holy Spirit that was given to the earth, to the church, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would help someone right now say, from this moment on, I want God to have all of me that there is. Father, help them say with their tongue and their mind and their heart, their lips, I want to bear fruit for you, O God. I want to glorify God the Father. I want to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. I want the power of the Holy Spirit to help me do the works of God, to grow in the garden where I'm planted. Father, free somebody now from that area that is glorifying evil and destroying them and is causing ruin in the garden, causing grapes to turn to rot. It's setting their life up for great pain and destruction. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, set us free from anything that's not glorifying you. Oh, Father God, I pray in Christ's name for this church. God, what a day it would be when this day, this hour, your people said, God has all of me that there is. Thank you for the shed blood of Christ that makes that prayer possible. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that makes that prayer possible. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Fill us with the power of the Spirit that we may honor the blood of the Son of God and the holiness of the Father and the will and purpose of the triune God. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us again? You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name. Beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus.
How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame The cross has spoken, I am forgiven The King of kings calls me His own Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living hope and hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my
Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.